Good morning. Good morning. Hey. It's good to be here today. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms. And um, I think there are some flowers for you here in a little bit as well. I don't want to spoil the fun, but you mean you see them. So you can probably put two and two together. <laughs> uh, today, uh, the message is if you believe, you belong. If you believe, you belong. There's a, there's a lot of variety in the, the responses Jesus gets in the New Testament. I mean, if you look through uh, throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see a lot of different responses of the people when it comes to their interactions with Jesus. And today we're going to be looking in John chapter 10, and we're going to see uh, a variety of responses even in this one section of Scripture. Uh, Jesus has been, in, at this point in John chapter 10, has been in Jerusalem for, um, since the arrival of the Festival of Booths in chapter 7. And he's been teaching regularly in the temple complex. And his teachings evoke a lot of responses, a lot of discussion happens because of what he's teaching. It's, uh, it's trending, if you will. It goes viral uh, back in the day. If there were a Twitter, Jesus would have all kinds of, uh, of viral uh, hashtags on that, okay? Uh, they talk about his identity. Like, who is this guy? They talk about his origins. Where did he come from? They talk about the authority that he has and that he claims that he has. And what happens is, with all these dis discussions, is the same thing that happens today. Guess what? It causes divisions. You got people who say this and who say that, and they hate each other, they can't stand each other, and you want to make sure you're on the right team because you don't want to be on the one that's going to lose, right? And so it creates these factions and divisions among the people. In fact, there are some people in this day who believe Jesus to be quite a few things. Some believe that he was a prophet. They're just, oh, he's just a good prophet. He, he's just these things or whatever. Some people said, you're actually the Messiah. You are the Messiah. You are the one that you say you are. You are the one we've been waiting for. You're the one who, uh, on whom we, we have all of our hope resting. But on the other side, you have people who think that he was demon-possessed. Like there's, there's, there's something, only Satan stuff could do this. This is demon-possessed stuff. And then worse than that, yeah, there is worse than that. They believed that he was a blasphemer who was worthy of death. That what you're doing is so blasphemous to the holy name of God that you need to be killed. And so in John chapter 10, verses 19 to 21, which is right before what we get to today, we see this. The Jews heard the words that Jesus was saying. They heard, he, they heard what he was saying, and again they were divided. Many of them said he was demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? But others says, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? All kinds of division. What do you believe about Jesus? If you believe, you belong. It kind of makes you if you really just take that phrase, which you got to be careful taking phrases, right, and headlines, you know, because you can twist what I'm saying right now to something I'm not saying right now. And so what do you mean by believe? What do you mean by belong? And so there's all, all, how you define those things. And so today specifically what I mean is if you believe that Jesus is the Lord, then you belong as a child of God. If you believe that He's the Son of God, that He died and rose again, and He is your Lord, you belong as a child of God. Now, as a church community, we allow people to belong to our community even if they may not believe, right? So you can have community with us. You can have uh, this belonging sense that we love you, we serve you, we give our lives for you, even if you don't believe Jesus is the one. So we don't create factions because of the love of Christ in our hearts. It inspires us to welcome people in, and you can belong to our church and come here and be part of our community until you believe. And even if you never believe, you can still belong here knowing that we love you. All right? So you can belong here, but what I'm talking about is belonging to God, where you can say, God, my Lord and my God, my Father, I belong to you as a child. It's not clear how much time passed between these discussions of, of who Jesus was and the discourse that, believe, that begins in this next verse, uh, because it actually happens at the Feast of Dedication, which is also known as Hanukkah. 
All right. So we're not sure exactly how long, but I'm going to read this for us right now. John chapter 10, verses 22 through 30. Then came the festival of the dedication of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple courts, walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were gathered around him, saying, they were gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. So they're wanting answers, right? Like there's a lot of stuff going on. We don't know what to believe. There's all these things happening. Just just tell us if you are, say you are, right? And Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. You see, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. And then he finishes with this. I and the Father are one. So once again at the temple complex, uh, this time at the portico of Solomon, some Jews gather around Jesus and they start asking questions. They ask, can you put an end to the debate that's going on about you? Can you identify yourself? Can you just tell us who you are once and for all? How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, just plainly tell us. But the problem is, no matter what Jesus says or does, they're not going to believe. No matter how clearly he states who he is, the debate is not going to end. And so Jesus responds that he's already told them and that the works he's done testify that he is doing this in the Father's name, yet they don't believe. And why do they not believe? He said, because you're not my sheep. You don't believe because you don't belong. If you were my sheep, you would hear my voice. And so the words and the works of Jesus are open to a lot of interpretations. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. We can debate on a lot of things he said. Right? It's just not easy. I mean, I love the Bible. I think it, and I believe it is the word of God. But I also believe that it, there, it can be difficult to understand. And there are parts of the Bible where people can be fully followers of Jesus and we can still see certain parts of it differently. Some things we have to agree on, like Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. There's some very clear passages that He does have, but sometimes one person can say, this is right here in black and white and so clear, and other people can say, well, if you look in the context of what's happening, maybe we're misunderstanding it. Maybe we're misreading Scripture through our lenses. You know, we're 21st century lenses. You know, I have these nice, beautiful glasses that have my lenses to help me see a little better because I can't see too close to me, all right? And so... Uh, we have our lenses that we look through in our 21st century back to a text that was written almost 2,000 years ago in the Old Testament even more. All right? So we have some work to do. It's open to a lot of interpretations, but the incident of the preceding chapter, which is chapter 9, is another example of how the works and the words of Jesus can be interpreted differently. So Jesus um, healed a man who was born blind in chapter 9. And the Pharisees see that Jesus healed on a Sabbath day, which was unlawful to do. You're not supposed to do that. So therefore, since Jesus did something that was against the law, he must be a sinner, right? And God doesn't sin, right? So he must be a sinner. So that brings into question this question right here. They asked this in chapter 9. Some of the Pharisees said this, This man is not from God. For he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. So on one hand, people are like, bruh, you can't do this. This is against the law. If you were from God, you would follow God's law. You're a sinner. You're wrong. And I'm dismissing everything about you. And I think it's not too hard to make that leap myself. Like I, I enjoy the law. There are certain laws that I think are fantastic for us. Do not murder, I think, is a great law. I think that's a bad thing to do. I'm glad we have that law. You should not do that, all right? And so there are certain laws that are really good. So if you break those laws, it's easy for us to say, since you've done this, I can no longer believe this about you any longer. On the other side of it is you say, well, wait a second. I know the law said this is wrong, but look, this guy was blind and now he can see. So how could a sinner 
do something so miraculously wonderful. And so they were divided. It's easy for us to be divided and misinterpret what God is saying. But the blind man gradually comes to realize who Jesus is, and in the end, he worships him. In the next verse, uh, it says, Then the man who was healed said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. He worshiped him. He didn't just say, I believe in what you're doing, and it's a good thing, thank you. I believe in what you've done, and I acknowledge that you are divine, that I worship you. This is kind of, I once was blind, but now I see. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. (laughs) And Jesus is, again, continuing to talk to them. And he says this in the next verse, he says, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Now there's a lot of things to interpret here. There is a, a tension still today between God's initiative. So God's taking the initiative and God stepping out and making the first move. There's a tension between that and human responsibility, what we do with what he's done. And it's, it's throughout the Bible, there's a tension, and there's still a tension today, even though we have all these different kinds of, 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 of systems that help us try to put God and His teachings into uh, a category that we can help understand. So they're, they're not all bad, uh, but they're limited, is, is what I would say. There's, there's not one theological system that fully encapsulates who God is. He's beyond that. But it can help us take steps, all right? And so... It's only with the eyes of faith that one can truly see who Jesus is. Those who belong to Jesus, they hear and recognize His voice, and then they do what? They follow Him. In chapter 10, verse 29, Jesus, we just read this earlier, says, My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my Father's hands. So when we hear Jesus' voice and we follow Him, when we believe, we belong. And nobody can take you away. Isn't that good news? That no one can take you away from God. That no matter what happens, you can't be taken away. Man, I want to use a quote from Dr. Strange, but I can't. It's too soon. You hadn't seen it yet. But there's a good one here. There's a good one right here. Okay. All right. To be continued on that one. But getting back away from that, everything does depend on God's initiative. That imbalance of where it is and where our responsibility is remains, but it all starts with God's initiative. It starts there. We have to agree on that. He created. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that He sent His Son. It all goes back to Him starting at the same time The result of Jesus coming into the world is that those who don't believe are subject to judgment. So there is a responsibility on our part. For example, what I just quoted, John 3, 16 and following, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him, this belief is a trusting belief, a a faith, I'm trusting in you, I'm, I'm following you, I'm believing you. It's not just like, oh yeah, that may have happened. That's not belief. Belief is, yes, I believe in Him, shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God, and we usually stop there, but let's keep going. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. And this is where we usually like to stop too. Jesus didn't come to judge. And He didn't. He came to to bring us freedom. Amen? Amen? Right. But why did He come to bring us freedom? It's because we were already condemned. This is where it gets a little tough to swallow in the 21st century. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, but whoever does not believe in Jesus stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness 
instead of light because their deeds were evil. It's like, I don't want to believe in this Jesus because I like what I'm doing just fine. This is getting me where I want to go. I'm fine here. It's uncomfortable there. The light's bright. It's kind of like waking up in the, you know, first thing and just opening the curtains and it's just so bright. Oh, that's just uncomfortable. You know, when our, when our evil deeds are exposed, that's even more uncomfortable, especially if we love the evil deeds. So there's this condemnation that we're living in because of sin. And so I can't resolve this tension. I'll never be able to resolve the full tension of God's initiative and human responsibility. And I can't argue anybody into faith, and you can't argue anyone to faith with convincing words. And that, uh, that's pretty safe to say because even Jesus couldn't do that. He had the most convincing words. But what we can do is declare the promise that creates and sustains life. And here's the promise. The good shepherd gives us eternal life. And the promise that he gives us in eternal life is that no one will ever snatch us out of his hand. Jesus said in John 10, 28, I give them eternal life. I, Jesus, give my sheep eternal life. They will, shall never perish. Now we know that we're going to die one day, right? But this perish that he's talking about here is not a temporary death, but an eternal one. It's contrasting eternal life with eternal death. They shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. We have eternal life through Christ. So we can help people discern the shepherd's voice. Like what really is the Lord's voice? Because a lot of times there are a lot of competing voices going on that are clamoring for our attention. Just imagine if you could hearing children, all right, maybe in a downstairs area, all right, and they're clamoring for attention, all right, in a, in a very, just imagine, it's hard, you, I see your imagination working in your faces right now, doing a great job, and so in, in the same way, there's these voices that compete in our hearts and our minds today that, that are not even so close to us and so real, but just out there that are so subtle, if we're not careful, we're going to start to believe things that aren't true. Man, I, I want to reference Dr. Strange again. There was another one for that one yesterday, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to do it. Um, and so we need to be able to say collectively what is and isn't a voice from God, and we need each other to do that. It's not always easy to recognize how voices that we believe are true are contrary to the Word of God. That's why we need one another. For example, there are a lot of voices that talk about how to grow closer to God. And so there's this prescribed um, religious experience maybe that you need to do this experience and then you'll be closer to God. Or, or you need to believe this certain aspect of this doctrine and then you'll be closer to God. Or, or maybe there's this, this higher level that you can get to to be closer to God. Or maybe if you'll stop doing this so much and have this raised level of morality, then you'll feel closer to God. But by contrast, Jesus the Good Shepherd tells us that everything depends on what? Belonging to Him. That's what it depends on. Do you belong to Jesus? Do you belong to Him? It's not about this prescription of what we can do. It's about belonging to Him. Our status before God does not depend on how we feel. A lot of things do depend on it, though. Like how we feel depends on how we feel. <laughs> you know, sometimes we just feel like bagu. I made that word up a long time ago uh, when I was a youth minister. Bagoo, b, bagoo, b u h goo. I, I, I was from the south, still am from the south, but I was living in the south too. And you, you have to be very careful with your language there, right? And so I, I said bagoo, and it, it stuck with me. So there we go. I hadn't done that in ten years here, uh, but there we go. Sometimes you feel like bagoo, but you got to push through the bagoo. All right. <laughs> Our status before God doesn't depend on how we feel. It doesn't depend on the right experience with God. It doesn't depend on being free of doubt. Doubt has its place in our lives. It's there. Our status before God doesn't depend on what we accomplish for Him either. It depends on one thing. Am I known by the shepherd? 
Am I known by the Good Shepherd? Jesus said, The sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. The voice of the Good Shepherd is a voice that, that liberates us. It doesn't oppress us. I think oftentimes we think it does. I don't want to follow Jesus. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that because it's going to weigh me down. It's going to cause me to, to be oppressed. But that is not the voice of the Good Shepherd. He liberates us. It doesn't say do this and then maybe you'll be good enough to be one of my sheep. If you'll follow this prescription, maybe I'll take you in. It says, the Good Shepherd says, you belong to me already. No one can snatch you out of my hand. And secure in this belonging that he gives to us, we're free to live a different kind of life. A life that's called abundant, abundant life. And he spoke about that earlier in the same chapter, chapter 10. He said this right here. He said, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. But I, the good shepherd, have come that they, my sheep, may have life and have it to the full. Have it abundant. And so this abundant life that Jesus talks about, is not necessarily about an abundance in years. There are great women and men of God, even children that have died early who loved the Lord and knew the abundant life of God, but they, their years didn't, uh, were not abundant. It doesn't mean that we're going to be abundant in wealth. It doesn't mean that abundant in status or even accomplishments. Those things we can have, they can absolutely be part of God's abundant life, but it's not a guarantee of those things. What is guaranteed is this life that is abundant will be abundant in the love of God. That you'll have so much of the love of God in your life, you can't outspend it. You can't exhaust it. And this love of God is made known only in Jesus Christ. So you can write this down if you want. The abundant life equals a love, the love of God. Abundant love. Lord, thank you that you love me. Thank you that I can never lose that. And so there's three things, and this is going to go very quickly. So if you want to write these down, I have three things to kind of finish with. Uh, God's love. How do we know God's love? Or what do we know about God's love in this abundant life that we can take away today? Uh, the first thing is that God love, God's love overflows to others. God's love overflows to others. It's not something that we're to receive and keep to ourselves. God's love is something that we receive and it overflows from us to others. You know, in, the, in money, you're saving for retirement or whatever it may be, you save, 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 invest, 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 and eventually you start to spend little by little is the trickle effect, right? You're kind of keeping for yourself, and that's fine. I'm talking about something different. I'm just saying the love of God isn't the same principle. The love of God is something that you take and it overflows from you because you're continuing to receive over and over. It's like a, a debit card that you can't outspend, all right? God's continually to make deposits in your account. And you want to outspend it. So you don't have to worry about keeping it for yourself. Give freely. And so he says this, that a new command, Jesus said, I give to you. A new command I give to you. Now, command here is the word command. All right? This is not a, a new suggestion or something you may want to think about. No, that's not what he's saying. I'm commanding you. I command you. I give this to you. Love one another. You don't have a choice in this. If you follow Jesus, you have to love one another. That's hard to do, right? Phew. For me... Not with you guys. You guys are great to love. <laughs> love one another. And then he goes on to expand. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, by you loving one another the way I love you, you everyone will know that you are my disciples. A disciple literally means follower, that you're truly following me. If you love one another. So the first thing about God's love, the abundant love, is that it overflows to others. The second one is this. God's love overflows to others, and it is eternal, as God is. God's love isn't temporary, it's eternal. One of the things that is so easy for us to do as people is that when we love someone and that relationship is severed for whatever reason, good or bad, 
it leaves a wound. And it makes us less eager to enter into another relationship where we're risking that love. And so, because we don't want it to be taken away. We don't have to worry about that with God's love. It's eternal. It won't be taken away. It is eternal as God is eternal. And so John 17, 3 says, Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life. God's love is eternal. So it overflows to others. It's eternal as God is. And the last one is God's love is exclusive to Jesus. That's how we know God's love. Belonging and knowing your God's child is exclusive to knowing Jesus. So it kind of goes back to the beginning. What do you believe about Jesus? Where are you? Is he just a prophet? Is he Messiah? Is he demon-possessed? Is he a blasphemer? Because he said, I and the Father are one. So he can't... He's, he's either lying, or he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. You've heard that before, right? He can't be a combination of those things. God's love is exclusive to Jesus. Jesus said to... This is in John chapter 11. He said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And so I'll leave you with this. Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in him? Amidst all the voices in the world, they evoke fear is what they, they you know, I think of news so easily on this one. But they just want you to be afraid of the other people, the enemy. And politics, the same thing. Don't want these people to get elected because X, Y, Z. It evokes fear. It makes demands. It gives advice. But there's a voice of a good shepherd, and he's speaking a promise over you. And what he is doing is calling you by name, and he's claiming you as God's own. He's calling you by name. Not just like, hey, you over there, I forget. What's your name again? That's not like, that's us, right? We forget names. Not Jesus. He knows you by name. He even knows your social security number. But don't worry, he's not going to do any identity theft. You're good, (laughs) all right? He knows everything about you. He knows every hair on your head. He loves you. And he's calling you and he says, you're mine. You're mine. You're mine. Forever. You're mine. If you believe then rest assured, you belong. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you so much for calling us by name and claiming us as your own. May our hearts be overwhelmed with your love so they would overflow freely through us to those around us, Lord. Teach us how to love people the way you love us. And Lord, I pray that you would Help us to truly believe you. I mean, it's one thing to say we believe. It's another thing to live like we do. So, Lord, I pray that, that my actions would, would show that I do believe in you. I pray that all of us would, would desire to hear your voice and to be living in a way that would be listening for your voice. Remove the distractions of the the voices in our lives that are taking us away from you, Lord. And help us to hear clearly from you. Lord, we bless you, the one true God, in Jesus' name. Amen.